Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Radwan Masmoudi. I'm the president of the Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy based in Washington, DC. And it's uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome you all to this webinar and to welcome Professor Elizabeth Thompson, uh, who is our main speaker uh, today. Uh, Professor Thompson, uh, the topic of, of our um, uh, discussion today is her recent book, how the West stole democracy from the Arabs, the Syrian Congress of 1920 and the destruction of its historic liberal Islamic alliance. Professor Elizabeth Thompson is uh, Mohammed Farsi Chair of Islamic Peace and Professor of History at the School of International Service uh, at the American University in Washington, DC. Uh, she has written several books, I think three or four books, but. Uh, the book that uh, we are meeting about today is this one, which I'm uh, uh, in the process of reading, and I really highly recommend it. Um, it's, it's a really uh, very, very interesting uh, book. Uh, it's, um, it's about the history, but recent history of Syria. Uh, and it shows that uh, the, the dialogue about compatibility of Islam and democracy uh, goes back at least 100 years and the struggle to find a compromise between Islam and democracy and to establish democracy in Arab countries and Muslim countries also goes back at least a hundred years. Um, and um, in this case, uh, it shows that uh, secular uh, thinkers and Muslim thinkers and Muslim scholars were able to work together uh, over a hundred years in 1919 in Syria to establish uh, the, probably the first democracy in Arab countries uh, uh, at the time. Uh, but how this effort was thwarted by the West and mainly by France and, and England, if I understand uh, correctly uh, the, the, the history and uh, as mentioned in the book. So it is our pleasure to uh, uh, have Professor Thompson with us today and to learn more about uh, her ideas and the history of Syria in 1919, 1920, and in that period, about 100 years ago. For those of you who uh, do not understand English, we have Arabic uh, interpretation available. Uh, all you have to do is click on the interpretation button, and you can choose uh, Arabic, uh, and uh, you will hear the voice of our interpreter, uh, Ma'taz Ghuban, who is uh, interpreting for us. Uh, today, so you can hear the interpretation live in, in Arabic. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Thompson. Um, uh, welcome again. Uh, very nice to meet you. Uh, you have about 20 minutes uh, to give us a summary of the okay. contents of the book and the main ideas uh, in the book, and then we will have about 30 minutes for Q&A. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you for your kind introduction and for the invitation to speak today. Um, if we can share screens, I'll show a few slides to help those who um, might need a little bit of a reminder of the history. Am I able to share screen? Am I a, a co-host? I believe so. Yes. Yes, you should there be able go. to. There we go. And mm -hmm. oh, hold on. I've got that on a funny. Let's just make that bigger. There we go. Can everyone see? I hope so. Yes. yes. <laughs> OK, great. Um, so uh, uh, I dedicated this book, which came out two years ago in paperback last year. And I have to maybe preface this by saying I hope there will be an Arabic translation of my book by the end of this year, okay? Oh, excellent, um, excellent. I dedicated the book to all Syrians in honor of their suffering over the past 10 years amid the violence of civil war. Today, millions go to bed still at night with little food in their stomachs, a tent for a roof perhaps, facing the COVID pandemic with no hospitals or doctors nearby. Uh, Syrian civilization, as we've seen terribly in the last decade, has uh, collapsed under the oppression of uh, dictatorship and the kind of brutal warfare that is now being imposed on Ukraine. And so I would like to, and I began thinking when I wrote this book about the connections between war, dictatorship, democracy, social, uh, welfare and so on. And as I wrote it, I came to believe that World War I was a catastrophe as important to defining Middle Eastern politics in the last century 
as the civil war here in the United States was for defining politics uh, in America. Um, if many of you do not, I hope, follow uh, American politics, but the same kinds of divisions about uh, the extent of federal political power versus, uh, you know, the responsibility of government for the society and so on are being replayed uh, that helped ignite that war long ago. So what I hope you will understand is my wrote the history, and I think this history has very much to speak to our moment today. <clears throat> and in particular, to think about how um, the moment after World War I was similar, again, if you know American history, you know that the US embarked on a reconstruction, a real revolution in American society, abolishing slavery, rebuilding a society on a new democratic basis in 1865 after its civil war. And so I came to understand that that was how Syrian Arab politicians who gathered at Damascus saw their job. They wanted to build a state that would protect the welfare of the people better than the Ottoman Turks had done in World War I, okay? That was the beginning point, but what I discovered in the archives in, uh, of those years, 1919, 1920, 1921, was a surprise that overturned everything I thought I knew about the relationship between Islam and democracy. It was not the culture, and it is not the culture of the Middle East or of Arabs that causes dictatorships, as many claim. In fact, it has been the actions of people, the choices of people, both in the region and beyond, that has determined uh, the political trajectory of the region. Um, in my book, the Arabs were Democrats in 1919, 1920, enacting a virtual revolution against the tyranny of the Ottoman Empire. Um, the Pyrian, the Europeans appear, as you'll see in a moment, as the anti-Democrats, who by destroying the Syrian Arab kingdom in 1920, laid the basis for the dictatorship that prevails not only in Syria, but elsewhere in the region today. Okay, let me move. Oh yeah, here we go. And here's to emphasize a little bit both the contrast and the continuity between that moment and this moment. Um, uh, when I began my research, as these pictures will uh, demonstrate for you, um, two things struck me, and this was back in 2013, okay? Uh, the first thing I discovered was to my surprise that the president of the Syrian Congress in 1920 was a religious man, Sheikh Rashid Ridda, as you see here. He led the drafting of a constitution that was and remains, in my view, the most democratic constitution ever in the Arab world. A constitution not only that guaranteed basic freedoms and rights, uh, that also gave power to uh, the representative and elected parliament over that of the king, but one in which in the name of equality of all citizens uh, sidelined the role of religion in the state. And he believed and argued to his fellow members of, of Congress at the Syrian government at that time, that that was an expression of a basic Islamic principle about the equality, the basic equality of human beings. The second thing that struck me when I began my research almost a decade ago, oh my God, uh, was that um, the, uh, was that the tragic event that was taking place in Egypt in the summer of um, uh, 2013. Egypt was where Ridda would go and spend his exile after the 1920 government was destroyed. That that summer, that the events of that summer had very much to do with the events of the summer of 1920. And as you recall, in August 2013 in Egypt, um, the Arab Spring uprising came to an end um, with a coup and then the massacre of uh, hundreds of Muslim brothers. The democratic revolution against Hosni Mubarak's dictatorship had begun in 2011 with a union of what we might call secular liberals and the Muslim brothers. But in 2013, uh, that bond had, uh, that uh, union had has split by 2013. And many of those who had supported the revolution now supported the coup by General Sisi against the president-elect Mohamed Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood. And so I wondered exactly what is the relationship? And I leave an open-ended question uh, you know, at the end of the presentation. But 
what I do want to show you in the next few minutes is that the success and the destruction of the democratic coalition between conservative, pious, religious leaders like Rashid Ridda and those who even a century ago wanted to establish a secular republic, you know, was the underpinning of creating what I think and I believe would have been a sustainable democratic regime that would have been a model for others in the Arab world, okay? Um, the history of its destruction was then set the stage for the bankruptcy of democratic movements since then in the Arab world. So let's just do a little bit of a historical background. As you all likely know, the Syrian Arab Kingdom uh, uh, was founded in uh, 1918 after the defeat of the Ottoman Empire. You can see in green here, uh, the extent of the Ottoman Empire uh, at the end of World War I. Prince Faisal, pictured on the right side of the screen, was a leader of the Arab revolt. Uh, he entered Damascus right here in October of 1918 and declared a constitutional state from the outset. However, he was informed that despite promises to his father that the Arabs would earn the right to an independent state at the end of, uh, at the, end of the war upon victory, um, and as a reward for their, their alliance uh, with the British and the French. He was forced to go to Paris, as you can see here. Um, he's standing in Paris with uh, his uh, sort of delegation. This was the French liaison with him. That's T.E. Lawrence there. Uh, his right-hand man was this man from Lebanon, a Shiite, interestingly, from uh, the Beka. Um, his name was uh, Rustam Haidar. Uh, and uh, this is Nouria Saeed, who would go on to be prime minister of Iraq later, uh, an Iraq that was profoundly undemocratic, but he was participating in a democratic movement in 1920 and 1919, as you see. Anyway, long story short, Faisal uh, very much impressed Woodrow Wilson, uh, the sort of star, the, uh, they call him a rock star of the Paris Peace Conference in the winter of 1919. He entered Europe to the cheers of many crowds he had proclaimed the rights of even small nations and the right to self-determination. Uh, he had opposed the use of World War I to expand colonial empires and insisted upon the right of the consent of the governed to um, whatever government would be imposed. And so after impressing Woodrow Wilson, uh, uh, you know, Faisal won at least provisional recognition under the new charter of the League of Nations. The League of Nations, of course, was the precursor to today's United Nations, all right? Uh, Wilson sent a committee of Americans uh, to uh, poll Syrians on what their preference is for the future of government, again, enacting the guarantee that the um, uh, Arabs and the peoples of the former Ottoman Empire the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was also defeated in the war, would uh, have a voice in the kinds of governments created uh, after the war. Upon Faisal's return to Damascus in May, elections were held for a representative Congress. You can see Rashid Ridda here with the blue star uh, as he was officially a delegate from Tripoli. His hometown was right outside of Tripoli, Lebanon today. Um, that uh, called Kalamun. Uh, here's Faisal. Here's a sort of inner circle of uh, advisors. Uh, Izzat Darwaze came from Nablus, Palestine. He would become the secretary of the Congress. Here is um, Hashem Atassi, who would become the first prime minister uh, in the Syrian, uh, after the Syrians declared independence in 19, March, 1920. The other thing to note, um, we have so few records, we can go into this in the q and I've had to use this poster, which was made in the spring of 1920, to really begin to figure out who was in that Congress, where were they from. There's an appendix to the book that shows you they came from around Bilad Sham or Greater Syria. Um, today is Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, right? Um, and uh, as you can see by the various headgear that they have. Some are wearing tarbushes, some are wearing turbans, 
Some are bareheaded. These are the younger um, members of uh, the uh, nationalist movement called the Fatat. Um, some were from tribal areas and considered themselves tribal sheikhs. And so I argue in the book that this was actually a representative government, not perfect. Uh, the British and French made it very difficult to hold elections in the territories that they directly occupied along the coast of what is today Lebanon and Palestine, but there you go. Um, they met with the King Crane Commission. They told the King Crane American Commission they wanted independence. They did not want a French mandate because the French would colonize them and treat them like a colony. If the League of Nations insisted that they be governed temporarily under a mandate, um, they preferred the Americans because they didn't think the Americans had any ambitions in Syria and that they would be honest advisors. However, that fall of 1919, uh, the US Senate voted to uh, reject ratification of the Versailles Treaty and membership in the League of Nations. And the Syrians, uh, no Syrians, the French and the British made moves to occupy Damascus and to uh, impose by force the mandates. Remember, the mandates were supposed to be adopted with the consent of the governed. One of our big stories about the discrediting and the, dis the defeat of the liberal idea in 1920 was that it was unable to use international law and the peace process to establish sovereignty, all right? And people would lose faith in these men. Um, just a parenthesis, and maybe we can talk about this in the Q&A. <laughs> I think it's important to tell the story of this defeat because I think that Syrians and other Arabs have to recognize that their struggle for democracy today stands on the shoulders of those who struggled for democracy in earlier generations, that it is an ongoing one. And I think it's an empowering thing to tell their story. Too often textbooks on Arab history emphasize military leaders, but military leaders have not been Democrats, right? And so I think telling the story of these civilians is important, okay? Anyway, abandoned by the, the Americans, it was in March of 1920, as you see here, that this Congress decided under the provisions of the League of Nations Charter, which had guaranteed them provisional independence, they declared independence uh, and established the um, uh, Syrian Arab Kingdom and convened a, uh, a committee to write their constitution. The Congress and the committee met in this building, which still exists in central Damascus in Marjorie Square. Uh, and uh, by July, they had through much debate, I'm reminded very much by the uh, record of the debates in 1787 about the uh, American constitution. Uh, these men really bargained with one another uh, about the terms on which they would live together as a nation. And again, this constitution was written for Bilad Hashem for all, you know, greater Syria, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Palestine, Israel, right? The thing that uh, just to highlight right here is uh, you know, in my short introduction is uh, article one, which was fully ratified um, that the Syrian, can you all see it? I don't know whether, um, there we go. The Syrian Arab kingdom is a civil representative monarchy. Its capital is Damascus and the religion of its king is Islam, okay? Now, this is significant because as I learned later, this was a compromise point in the Syrian uh, debates over the constitution. There were those in March of 1920 who wanted a state much like the Ottoman state based on Islam. There were others who said no, the Abdul Hamid and the Ottoman Sultan Caliphs had abused their power. We need to circumscribe the power of the monarch and assure power to the elected parliament, hence the civil representative monarchy, okay? Um, and here we have Rashid um, you know, uh, in March, 1920, uh, at the beginning of the discussions over the constitution, Rashid Rida, who might, mentioned earlier, uh, stepped in to force a compromise, okay? And it was only somebody like him. You have to understand, he published this magazine, a Menard, which was read from Morocco 
all the way to Indonesia at that time. Muslims around the world knew the name of Rashid Ridda. He was the kind of guy you had to kiss the ring of when, you know, when he stood up and they all would applaud him when he spoke, right? And, and, and so in some ways, having the right man in the right place was important, right? Because the Congress was quite divided between younger secularists, much as 2011, right? And older conservative people who didn't, did not believe that Syria was ready for a secular government and were used to the Ottoman system. It was Reda who argued that, uh, look, we can make a compromise. Uh, to satisfy those who think that the population needs a kind of religious figurehead, we will make the king a Muslim. Faisal was elected king, all right? Uh, but nowhere else in this constitution is there any mention of Islam as the source of legislation or as a state religion, right? Um, there is uh, instead a pledge by, on the part of the uh, a requirement that the monarch make a pledge and take an oath that he will respect divine laws written specifically to uh, allow for uh, something beyond Islam and um, the constitution. He was obliged. This is not something that the Ottoman Sultan ever had to take an oath for. And indeed, uh, it may well be that Syrians in ratifying this constitution in July, 1920, disestablished Islam years before Mustafa Kemal Ataturk did. But the point to understand here is they did it with the cooperation of religious men. Okay, I was watching what was happening in the last decade in Tunisia to think about whether we were going to reenact um, a new coalition or not. Rida uh, created a democratic state which he believed fully adhered to the principles of Islam. Okay, impossible today. And one of the reasons that's impossible, almost every other, every Arab constitution today lists Islam either as a state religion or as a source of legislation, right? Um, which becomes problematic. Those of you who are democratic theorists understand once you make, a, you know, you vest in experts in divine law, a decision whether some, uh, a law is kosher or not is like, is, is acceptable or not, uh, you are undermining um, the democratic process. And that's because Rida forcefully argued for the idea of a maslaha al amma, the public interest, and that there is a limit to the jurisdiction of religious law and that we need a constitutional assembly and a Congress, a parliament that will make laws that will take care of the welfare of the people in our own age. Remember, he is working right after the devastating uh, World War I, where almost half a million people died of a famine in greater Syria. Indeed, Ridda was worried about his own family. He was in Cairo during the war. His family was in Lebanon, hardest hit by the famine, right? He was very much motivated by the need and the belief that only a democratic government would take care of its people. Okay, so there we go. However, all this was very good. And remember, um, those of you who are in the Washington DC area know, perhaps know of and have heard from a political scientist named uh, Nathan Brown. He's at George Washington University. And um, I was very much interested and it took a cue from his argument about the process recently of writing a constitution for Iraq, okay? And he said, constitutions are not theoretical documents imposed from above. They must be, if they're going to be long lasting, argued passionately by opposing parties. They must be compromises that people can live with. And so I believe that the constitution of 1920 in Syria, as they say, had legs was viable, would have on its own assured the growth, not perfect. Look at our own democracy in the United States or elsewhere in the world, right? Democracies are not smooth, but I believe it, it, it would have been viable very, very quickly. And then I want to allow you, you know, I want to discuss things with you. Um, you may all know that the, the response of Europe was A, not to recognize Syrian independence and furthermore to divide greater Syria at the San Remo conference in April, 1920. Uh, you know, this is uh, uh, Prime Minister Milleron of France. This is David Lloyd George. 
Uh, outside the door over here were standing Faisal's representatives. They were not allowed in the room at the time that this decision was made. And uh, as you most of you well know, uh, Greater Syria was divided between France in blue. Uh, France would divide Syria, Lebanon, and even carve out smaller entities within Syria. And Britain took Palestine, creating Transjordan uh, and Iraq, right? Um, they effectively decided at San Remo to impose the mandates by force, complete violation of the League of Nations charter. Most chilling uh, in uh, my, again, I had to do extensive research in Paris in the archives uh, there of the foreign ministry. Uh, most chilling was that uh, Alexander Milleron uh, of France ordered that every trace of that government be destroyed along with the state. Okay, that is why I believe the story of the Syrian Congress of 1920 has not been told before. All right, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, building that they met in was occupied by the French and ransacked. Uh, documents were destroyed uh, and we'll go into the Q&A. They even published a mistranslated, distorted constitution of 1920 in French, um, which to this day has covered up the fact that what happened in, in Damascus in 1920 was a democratic revolution. Okay, uh, here's a, did the army prepared to invade Damascus. The Syrians were quickly defeated. They were not permitted to uh, import uh, weapons. So their army was poorly uh, armed and the French invaded Damascus and effectively ended democratic politics in Syria. By imposing the mandates by force, Britain and France laid the foundations for dictatorship in the Eastern Arab world. And just very briefly, it would prove difficult, even impossible to bring religious conservatives and democratic secularists together again after 1920 in order to restore democracy to Syria. France in the 1920s and 30s created its own anti-democratic elite landowning tribal ruling class, okay? resistant to the return to democracy at the end of France's occupation in 1946. In the meantime, opposed them because now liberals were seen as collaborators with the colonial power were new Islamist movements, okay? Who looked, instead of looking to Europe, now you have to remember Rashid Ridda completely believed in the universal principles of liberalism. He even went to Europe to appeal at the League of Nations against the mandate in Syria because he had faith that there were liberals in Europe who believed that all peoples should enjoy freedom and democracy. And it was the defeat of his appeal at Geneva that turned him against the West and advised Muslims to find justice within Islam. So here was the man who once said, we do not need Islamic law as the basis of our government giving lectures of the very opposite sort. And one of his students was in Cairo, Hassan al-Banna. And uh, I argue here and in a previous uh, book that I published that Banna uh, and the foundation of the Muslim Brotherhood, as soon as it entered politics, the premise was that, uh, you know, justice had to be uh, established through Islam and against the West, that the West and liberalism were hostile to Islamic principles of justice. A uh, 180 degree turnaround from 1920 for Rashid Rida, okay? At the same time in Syria, there were Islamist groups that grew up. Here's uh, Rashid Rida's friend, close friend. They both uh, had lived in Cairo in exile, uh, Sheikh Kamal Qassab, who became a leader of an Islamist movement that would turn into the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood in the 1940s. And he opposed, if you remember, Hashim Atassi, who had been prime minister in 1920, but was now part of the secular national bloc. Here he is, um, which cooperated with the French and took power. They would be at loggerheads at the time of independence in 1946. And indeed, it would be the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood that would insert 
into Syria's 1950 constitution, the first constitution after independence, um, the requirement that uh, laws be based on Islamic law, okay? Um, and so the, I argue at the end of my book that the cleavage, the split between liberal Democrats and Muslims uh, created by the invasion of 1920 endured over the decades in Arab politics and still persisted in Syria and Egypt and elsewhere in the year 2011. And that perhaps um, with this historical perspective, we can understand that what is necessary in order to rebuild a stronger democratic coalition is to understand this history and to understand that the cleavage between Muslims and uh, you know, uh, Islamists and Democrats is a product of a particular moment in history, not natural, right? That, uh, uh, and that it is con was contingent on events and decisions taken in the 1920s, and therefore is something that we can reverse or you know, rejigger, if you will, or re-engineer in favor of democracy today. So thank you. I hope that overview helped uh, situate my book for you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Professor Thompson. This was uh, extremely helpful and useful. Um, I have a lot of questions in my mind, but uh, let me open it uh, to the audience and the participants uh, and uh, uh, allow them uh, the opportunity to ask questions. So if you want to ask questions, um, you can ask in uh, th three different ways, uh, either by raising your hand, uh, push uh, the raise hand button, and we will give you the mic. You can ask uh, your question directly to Professor uh, Thompson or by uh, uh, writing your question in Q&A. There is another, another button that says Q&A. You can ask your question there. Or in the chat section, you can ask your question also in the, in the chat section. So um, let me uh, see if we have other questions. So the first question is, can you change the setting so that we can see each other, uh, see other questions, please? Um, yes, you can see other questions. Uh, you can also hear other questions if, there are, if they are uh, asked uh, orally and you can see them in chat. Uh, but so far, I do not have any question in chat. Let me see. Okay, um, so let me go ahead and ask the first question, uh, Professor. Um, actually, it's two questions. First of all, in your, in your study, um, what was the main reason that the British and the French were opposed uh, to democracy? Is it uh, just that they wanted to uh, colonize uh, Syria? Or are there other reasons that they were uh, concerned about why they opposed democracy? Why why, don't, why didn't they support this nascent democracy in Syria? The That's other question, question. Yeah, go ahead. The, the, the other question is what was the response of the United States when, uh, mm. when Syria was colonized and, and this first attempt at building democracy in Syria was crashed and, and destroyed? What was the response of uh, President Woodrow Wilson and Congress and you know, the whole US uh, administration? No, those are two great questions. Thank you so much. Um, on the first question, uh, from what I could read in the correspondence of the French prime minister and uh, their counterparts in, uh, in England, and particularly Lord Curzon, who was the foreign minister in, and former viceroy of India, <laughs> they had a colonial out uh, outlook. The people in the cabinet of Lloyd George, who was the prime minister uh, in England, and Mitterrand had grown very close to what was called the colonial lobby in France. Mm. Um, again, this story is so much tied to that wartime context. And I don't think we could understand the decisions of any of the parties outside of the fact that they had just come out of a terrible war, right? Tens of millions had disappeared 
in that war. There hadn't been a war like that in the world, at least in anyone's memory, right? This is before World War II, of course. Um, and it is time, uh, as I pointed out, where the Middle East was actually much more drawn in directly to World War I than World War II. Then. So there was no, ultimately no point to that war, if you recall. I mean, anybody who's read about World War I, you know, the, the books are all about, well, why did we get into it? And why did people continue to fight and slaughter one another for those four years? It's, it, it, it's a great tragedy uh, in human history because, you know, the allies, slapped onto their coalition, the idea that, oh, well, we're fighting for democracy against the German Kaiser and the evil emperor of the Austro-Hungarian empire and the Ottoman Sultan, and we stand up. But if you look, in fact, the coalition, uh, many historians have shown, was built only when the British and French could promise other members of the coalition territory whether it be German colonies in Africa or pieces of the Ottoman Empire, islands in the Pacific. There was a huge fight over uh, mm. Shandong Peninsula in China. Japan wanted that. So Japan came in thinking, OK, if I, we fight with the allies, we're going to get this nice piece of territory in China and maybe some Pacific mm. islands. Italy joined mainly because it thought uh, would get a piece of Anatolia which is part of today's Turkey, and so on. So the whole diplomatic corps was suffused with people who uh, believed they had to show their populations there was a point to the war by winning colonial provinces and expanding their empires, right? Um, there was uh, opposition, and I think historians have been wrong to neglect the degree of opposition to colonial expansion at that time. We can go into that. But those who were in the seat of power needed to show that they were right to keep fighting that war. And so, you know, it's very famous when <clears throat> the British entered Jerusalem and Palestine in December of 1917. Lloyd George called that a Christmas gift to the British people, right? Um, so you get the picture. Um, they were very concerned, however, and that story has been told. There are plenty of books out there. You know, there's the movie Lawrence of Arabia that shows um, how imperialist the leaders were. But I think also important, and what my book brings new to this story, is they were also very concerned that the Syrians had actually established a democracy because they ruled in North Africa, in South Asia other parts of the Islamic world um, and justified their rule as saying, well, we need to teach you how to rule yourselves in the modern way because you are tribal peoples who will kill, you know, minorities and, um, you know, you, you're, you're weighed down by your Islamic traditions and uh, you're not ready to govern yourselves, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and so that was the compromise behind those band-aids that somehow the Arabs would be provisionally independent, but they needed a little bit of guidance and so on, right? Mm -hmm. The Syrian Arabs saw right through it. The other thing I think I bring in this book uh, by using so many Arabic memoirs, okay, uh, is how aware those people were in that Arab Congress, that Syrian Arab Congress, right? They, uh, they understood exactly what the British and French were doing, what lies they were telling, and what their strategy was. They were not dupes. They were not stupid, right? Um, and I think particularly people who want to tell a military history would like to just dismiss the civilians who ultimately did fail, it's true, but as though they were simple and they didn't understand the real thing. That is, you know, uh, if you read the history of Turkey is the, you know, a uh, story of victory, right? That the Turks win their independence under Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. And Mustafa Kemal would like you to think that's because he was a strong military man, right? And, um, and so those who uh, were defeated in July, 1920 in Syria were disgraced. They were humiliated, right? And at one level, it was very hard after that to build enthusiasm for a popular democratic movement because it didn't guarantee sovereignty, right? 
And mm -hmm. so the British and the French had succeeded in destroying democracy, but also mm -hmm. succeeded in preventing Syria from becoming a model that Moroccans and Algerians and Tunisians and Iraqis and others would say, hey, and particularly Egyptians would say, hey, mm -hmm. if they can rule themselves as a democracy, so can we, we deserve independence mm -hmm. too. Um, briefly mm -hmm. on the American response, Woodrow Wilson suffered a uh, catastrophic stroke, stroke in late September, mm -hmm. 1919. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, he was not there to voice opposition. Uh, the report written by his commission had been put in a drawer and covered up in the summer of 1920. Um, or, you know, in 1919, 1920, it was only when one of the leaders of that commission, Charles Crane, who visited Damascus in 1922, and, uh, you know, political leaders swarmed around him, newspapers published, you know, how joyous Syrians were to welcome an American back, you know, and to expose the tyranny of the French, that... Crane was able to convince Woodrow Wilson to uh, permit the publishing, the public publishing of the commission's report from the summer of 1919, which showed the vast majority of Syrians did not want French rule, right? Um, and exposed what the Europeans had done. Very good. Um... We have five questions uh, in the Q&A section. So uh, okay. if you don't mind, I'm gonna read them sure. to you and, uh, and you can answer them um, in any order you want. Right. So the first one is by uh, uh, Professor Herman Cohen, retired US ambassador. Uh, does the Muslim Brotherhood have any experience governing democratically? Mm, very nice, thank you for that question. Very important question. Um, uh, as I suggested in my talk, I think the um, origins of the Muslim Brotherhood in 1928 Egypt and around the same time in Syria lay in it being an anti-colonial movement and in the, um, in the idea that the West was, uh, had used democracy to dupe the Arabs, right? Um, that the war was not really about a war to make the world safe for democracy. And that liberalism was a corrupt Trojan horse ideology. So at its outset, uh, it was not democratic. Minorities in Egypt in particular would suffer attacks um, in the 1940s, which is um, actually the 1940s is the subject of my next book. But I would say that the Muslim brothers who emerged later in Egypt and later in Syria, post 1982 Syria, uh, mm -hmm. when the militant wing of the Muslim Brothers was defeated, and in Egypt, um, uh, the mainstream Muslim Brothers had renounced the use of violence after 1970. Uh, we see the emergence of real democratic elements within the leadership. It is a story not yet fully told, but there are several really good books on what happened in 2011. Uh, that show how those younger, often younger members of the Muslim Brothers who were ready and, you know, in spirit shared the democratic views of their secular allies in the uprising um, were shut down by an older leadership. Um, so I would not, you know, so I'm gonna twist your question a little bit. Um, they were not given space in Syria or Egypt in the late 20th century to demonstrate any kind of possibility of democratic governance. Um, it's highly contested whether we can say that Mohamed Morsi was anti-democratic in his actions in the unfortunate um, uh, events surrounding a new constituent assembly in uh, late 2012 and so on. We can talk about that more, but no, uh, I would say uh, on the other hand, within their movements, and I would point to an old book by an old friend of mine, Anthony Shadid, who died in Syria, as some of you may know, he'd been a reporter for the Times and for the Washington Post, right, uh, argued in uh, a book that came out, unfortunately, right at the time of 9-11, uh, 
to show that within the groups, if you looked inside of many of the Islamist groups that were grounded in uh, protecting the welfare of their people and not committed to international militancy, you did see elements of democratic governance within their movement. So complica complicated non-answer. I apologize, Ambassador Cohen. <laughs> No, it's a, it's a, I think it's a good answer, which shows that there is a diversity of views and opinions uh, within the Muslim Brotherhood itself. Yeah. So uh, next question is, what was the role of Arab nationalism in the making of the coalition mm. between seculars and Muslims? That's a great question. Thank you so much. I learned something new in doing my research in that, um, you know, there have been many debates about the origins of Arab nationalism. Did it exist before World War I? Did it really only emerge after World War II? You know, we historians have many debates like that. But what I learned when I really read the transcripts of what Faisal argued at Paris, right? And what his advisors from the Fatat organization, which was the sort of young Arab nationalist organization was this. They used strategically a rhetoric of Arab unity, common language, and so on, to match the rhetoric at Paris. In Paris, you know, the great powers were deciding, do Poles deserve a, an independent Poland? Well, you know, is there a majority of people who speak Polish there? You know, the same for the Czechs and the Slovaks. Czechoslovakia was created, right? The South Slavs had to argue, okay, there are some differences between Serbs and others, but, you know, we essentially have the same culture, therefore we should be a nation state. It was necessary to deploy that at Paris. But if you look back at home, right? Um, yes, Arabic was the official language, but there was no, uh, there was no language about imposing Arabism amongst the variety of people who lived within greater Syria. Uh, so, uh, you know, they did experience a sort of, uh, you know, appeal to a, a common heritage going back hundreds of years to the old Arab empires to sort of rally people in speeches, right? But this was not the kind of Arab nationalism that would be used to oppress people later in the 20th century. Very good. Um, Muhammad al husari asks, what is the role of foreign interventions, uh, in parentheses, UAE and Saudi Arabia, yeah. in the demise of Dr. Morsi? Uh, well, I will say this, that's not obviously my area of research, lies 100 years ago, and I read yes. the same <laughs> secondary kinds of sources that you probably do, so I won't pretend to have great expertise, but I will say <laughs> this from a historical perspective, it is highly interesting to me that um, the uh, foreign intervention and regime change seems to be a constant in Arab politics over the last century, particularly in the Eastern end of the Mediterranean. Um, and, uh, you know, we have to remember that before we want to tar individuals or look at, you know, to uh, calibrate whether uh, you know, these various groups within Arab societies are truly democratic or not, we have to understand that they do not, they do not operate in a sovereign political sphere in which they can be sure if they make a political deal that that deal will hold and that an outsider might not come in as a spoiler, if you will. So to me, the interventions of Saudi Arabia and the UAE were a, um, a, a familiar pattern. Um, but I will say this in addition, um, the prominent role and the ability of conservative monarchies, creations of the colonial era in the Gulf, right? And I did not mention the role of oil in the colonial ambitions of the British and French mm -hmm. in the 1920s, but that was certainly there, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. is also historically contingent, right? There's a very good book by a Harvard professor Rosie Bashir on the ways in which uh, the, the uh, Saudi state in particular has fashioned a, a sort of story of its own history that belies the fact that even up through the 1950s, there were democratic movements in Saudi Arabia that may have prevailed. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A question from Elena Sue. 
thank you for this fascinating presentation. What is your view of the prospects of democracy in the Arab world going forward? Which countries offer the greatest possibility? And do the Abrahamic Accords play any role in this? Oh, boy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Again, a uh, very, uh, you know, as a historian, I feel like an interloper in uh, contemporary <laughs> politics. And as a historian, you know, the reason I'm a historian is I do not want to be in the business of predicting the future. I leave that to political scientists and so on. But I will say, oh, at least, at least help us understand the present. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> but um, I'll just sort of maybe um, elaborate on the final point in my presentation that the, you know, I, I mean, I went to Tahrir Square. I did not go to Syria after 2011. So I can't say I've met Syrians in exile, but I did go to Tahrir Square and, you know, to Egypt twice, um, once in 2011 and once in 2013. And I did talk to people because I wanted to write a book about for mm. the activists today. Okay. Hmm. And I was shocked at how poorly they understood their history. You know, most students in public education in Egypt, it's, I, did, I did attend the University of Damascus in the 1980s, I will mm -hmm. tell you. So I know what history education is there. Um, they're not, you know, able to see and understand what the obstacles were. They certainly have no hmm. clue about this story um, that hmm. the, you know, both sides, both the Islamists and the secularists have to understand that they are products mm -hmm. of a split from the 1920s, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That was based mm -hmm. on a lot of misinformation and based mm -hmm. on political needs of that moment and is not essential. And so mm -hmm. I would say the future of democracy in the region would be if, you know, self-awareness, not only through history, but through other means, allows for a, a stronger coalition to uh, emerge uh, amongst mm. political activists in the next round. But of course, that does not speak to the militarization of the states and the foreign support for those powers and so on. Mm. Um, mm. You know, that is, of course, a, a, another kettle of fish. So to the last part of your question, which countries would be better poised? Those that, like Tunisia, that are less within the sights of foreign powers, where the stakes are not as high, probably stand a better chance. <laughs> Let's hope so. Uh, Rosa Alvarez um, asks, since 19th century until nowadays, the adoption of principles of political modernity by Islamist thinkers and moderate Islamist political parties seems sometimes much more advanced than that done by some secular liberal groups. Mm. Is there a relation between that and the persistent Western focus on questioning the democratic mm. credentials of Islamists and the lack of it when it comes to the so-called secular. <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly that the, uh, <laughs> the record of scholarship has been uh, biased and skewed, but I do see some correctives out there. Um, uh, and I expect in the next decade in particular, uh, there's a whole new generation of scholars who are going to change that narrative and not play into those old stereotypes. So I agree. Excellent. Mohammed al Hussari, uh, oh, he asked, the, we asked the question already. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we, ha we have um, Azada Kian. What was the role of, no, we asked that also, sorry. And we asked that. So we have two more questions. Hopefully we can finish them in three minutes. Yeah. Uh, Nano Bello asks, okay, historically, you have shown that colonial countries destroyed the roots of democratic Syria in the 20s, 1920s. But today, how, without secular regimes, Islamic countries can be real democracies? Ah, well, that is a huge question. I'm sorry we don't have more time to explore it, but I will say this. Exposing the fact that uh, leaders like uh, Rashid Rida were in fact open to the idea that Islamic civilization partakes of principles, is based on principles analogous to or similar to principles of other civilizations, that there can be a universalism is I think a first step, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that, uh, uh, you know, but that the, there are powers that are bent on preventing that kind of discourse. And I will say I uh, felt much concern when I learned that all of Rashid Ridda's private papers had been bought 
by the government of Saudi Arabia and are now in Riyadh uh, oh and not ac accessible in the same way. And I can mm -hmm. only fear that it is because there are inconvenient truths in that record, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So they're not publicly available. Well, I mean, I know a couple of people have tried and you get one or two sheets of paper and somebody looks over your shoulder, you know, they are not um, as available as they could be. Um, so, yeah, um, that's another okay. podcast, <laughs> you know, uh, yes. the entire, yes. uh, you know, uh, cultural patrimony of Egypt is being sold off to Gulf, Gulf countries. I part of my oh next my project God. involves cinema. You know, the wow. Egyptians were very important in the uh, early Arab cinema in the 1930s sure. and 40s. Uh, and yet nobody's protecting the, wow. right, you know, the, uh, the archives that belong to cinema. Wow. You know, they're all being sold wow. off in black market and, and the highest bidders wow. tend to be countries where, you know, access to information is, uh, is not as open. So I'm sorry to say. Wow. Hmm. Uh, Francis Guy asks, given how Kurdish issues somewhat derailed discussions at the Syrian National Congress yes. nearly 100 years later, uh, do you have any reflections on the role of the Kurds in 1919, or were they being recognized as potentially independent by the Syrian Democrats? No, oh, thank you for asking that question. You know, we are in the process of um, opening a, a, a reinvigorated Kurdish studies program at American University. So I've been doing a bit of work on Kurdish history. I will say this, I had to check with experts. The Kurds inside Syria in 1919 were largely Arabized. So they were not upset that the uh, official language was Arabic. All right. The case in the 1950s and particularly after the Ba'ath Party came to power in the 1960s is radically different. OK, um, mm -hmm. large numbers of Kurds had entered Syria in the 20s and 30s as a result of fighting in Anatolia, um, and they were disenfranchised later. But um, mm -hmm. that, was, that was the sort of reason behind my, my answer to the question on Arab nationalism. Arab nationalism at that moment was not seen as excluding non-Arabs, if you will. Uh, but mm -hmm. that was a great question. I think the final questions for uh, today's session uh, comes from Elena Su. What about the role? I mean, I, she asked it, but I think you did yeah, not, I, I didn't uh, answer, answer it, it sufficiently. <laughs> what about <laughs> the role of the Abrahamic <laughs> Accords in potential democratization trends? Do you think they will help or they will hurt those uh, democracy in the region? Uh, I have no comment on that one. I, ca I can't see <laughs> how it would help, but I have not studied it closely enough to feel I could give you an expert opinion. Okay. But thank you for okay. the question. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, at least to me, uh, this is really, really uh, very helpful and very um, useful uh, because uh, we at CSID have been uh, fighting for the idea of uh, compatibility of Islam and democracy for 22 years now, since 1999. Uh, when we were first established here in Washington, D.C. And it's been a tough ride. It's been very yeah. uh, tough uh, movement. We thought we made a lot of progress in the last 10 years, especially in Tunisia. Now, even in Tunisia, we are having a coup against the, the only democracy so far in, 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 in the Arab world uh, following the Arab Spring. So um, it really gives me a great support to know that the movement is at least 100 years old, you know, that, uh, <laughs> that there were people in Syria who were fighting for the same fight that we are uh, joining today, and that hopefully we will continue in the future until we succeed. Um, I have no doubt that the Arab world will not uh, uh, be immune to, uh, to democracy for much longer, and that the, the younger generation uh, will push for real democracy and will fight for real democracy. And also I agree with you that uh, dialogue and, and compromise between Islamists and secularists is really uh, an essential ingredient for this democracy to, to take place and to, and to succeed uh, in the Arab world. Uh, so uh, we've been working a lot on dialogue between Islamists and secularists and, and finding a common ground between them so they can agree on, on, on a platform for democracy in, uh, in, their, con in their respective countries. 
So thank well, you very much for yeah, thank joining us. Thank you so us. much. You have, last, you have a speaker. last word. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We yes. really and, enjoyed um, having And just a last word on that. Um, an unintended consequence, perhaps, of, the, of 2011 yes. is that it will open up the possibility of reforming new kinds of Islamic groups that are not beholden to the old ideas from Banna's generation mm -hmm. onward. Do you see what I'm saying? That maybe, yeah, you know, yeah, I can yeah, only hope. Yeah. And that, so I, I hope others will uh, write the histories that I do. I hope, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that the Arabic translation of my book will be available on out. the internet. Um, yeah. So oh, it should right. avoid censorship. Uh, yes. And I'm hoping, knock on wood, <laughs> I'm at very early stages, but I'm hoping to make either a movie or a TV series based on the book. Wouldn't that be great? Oh, wow. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Uh, yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much, Professor thank Thompson. You, it was okay. a pleasure, pleasure to meet you and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. Um, goodbye, everybody, and we'll see you at the next uh, webinar, inshallah. Bye-bye.